psychopath, ill, or crazy. These are the names we use to talk about serial killers. People who kill and then eat their victims are a different kind of crazy. It goes without saying that they make regular people afraid. What do they do when they are locked up? Do they worry about their lives all the time? Do they become targets and always have to watch their backs? Or do the other people in the prison also fear them? Find out what really happens in jail to people who eat people. Stephen Dahmer, it's Jeffrey Dahmer, the serial killer and cannibal, whose story has been brought to life again by the hit Netflix show, Monster. He looks good, but you'd never guess that he's bad. But that's a different story when you hear him. Milwaukee was his killing ground, and he got away with murder for over 10 years. It's possible that Jeffrey Lionel Dahmer is the most well-known killer in history. His nicknames, the Milwaukee Cannibal or the Milwaukee Monster, make it very clear that he kept people in Milwaukee up at night. Having killed 17 people, Jeffrey Dahmer is the only word that can be used to describe him. Who was Jeffrey Dahmer really? What made him change into the horrible person he was? How did they catch him? What was it like for him to be locked up? He was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin on May 21st, 1960. A lot of talk has been made about his parents and how they might have helped make the monster that everyone knows. Lionel Herbert Dahmer, his dad, studied chemistry and then worked as a research chemist. Dad was busy with school for most of Dahmer's childhood, so he didn't spend much time with him. We know this because he spent a lot of time with his teletype machine teacher mum, Joyce Annette Dahmer. There were a lot of problems with Dahmer's mum. She was depressed, needed constant care, and spent more and more time in bed. So neither parent spent a lot of time with their son. People at Dahmer's grade school thought he was shy and quiet, so he didn't have many friends. Interestingly, Dahmer showed an interest in dead animals from a very young age. His dad said that Dahmer was strangely excited by the sound the bones made. He was so interested in animal bones that he once asked what would happen if chicken bones were put in bleach. Since his first year at Revere High School, Dharma was one of the odd ones out because of his problems at home, which led him to drink too much. His parents fought all the time, and in 1978 they finally got a divorce. It was also that year that Dharma killed his first person, a hitchhiker named Stephen Mark Hicks. He killed this person just three weeks after graduating from high school. This was the first of 16 killings he would do. Dharma says he started to actively look for victims. Most of the time, he met them in or near gay bars and would usually get them to come to his grandmother's house in West Allis, Wisconsin. He would give his victims drugs and then choke them to death when they were out of it. Then he would cut their bodies up and throw the pieces away in the trash. But he kept their heads and then ground them up a few months later. The Milwaukee monster was so sick that he would sometimes kiss and talk to the heads of his victims while he cut up the rest of their bodies. On July 22nd, 1991, Dharma's reign of terror would end. Then he was caught after his failed attempt to kill his 18th victim, Tracy Edwards. Police in Milwaukee found body parts in an apartment on the north side. They now wonder if they've found a place where people are being killed. Parts of bodies were found by police, which made them think the man they caught killed many people. Dharma decided to admit to his crimes, so he gave up his right to have a lawyer present during his interrogations, which was a surprise. He said that he was the one who made this horrible thing happen, and that he wanted to do anything to stop it. It was even said that the Milwaukee monster had eaten the hearts, livers, arms and legs of some of his victims. Dharma was charged, and he later said he was guilty in court. The courtroom was tense when Dharma was sentenced, because the families of his victims spoke out about their sadness. More people were shocked when Dharma's lawyer said his client wanted to speak in court. Then Dharma walked up to a stand and read a statement that he and his lawyers had written while he stood in front of the judge. I never wanted to be free. To be honest, I wanted death for myself. This was a case to make it look like I did something I didn't out of hate. I didn't hate anyone. I knew I was either sick or bad or both. I think I was sick now. 
Even worse, Dharma said he knew his time in jail would be terrible. I know that going to jail will be awful, but I deserve it because of what I did. He told the court the truth, and it looks like he was right. Concerns about Dharma's safety led to him being locked up alone for the first year of his sentence. Surprisingly, Dharma was moved to a less guarded area when he asked to be there. This turned out to be a bad idea. On July 3rd, 1994, while Dharma was sitting in the jail church, Osvaldo Duruti, another prisoner, tried to cut Dharma's throat with a razor stuck in a toothbrush. He made it through the attack, but a few months later he would not be so lucky. On the morning of November 28th, 1994, Dharma was found on the floor of the gym's bathrooms with severe head injuries. He was declared dead at a nearby hospital an hour later. Christopher Scarva, another prisoner, hit Dharma over the head with a metal bar many times until he passed out. Dharma knew that this kind of thing would happen. Dharma's family says he had been ready to die for a long time and was okay with any punishment he might get in jail. The first time someone tried to kill him, he even told his mum on the phone, It doesn't matter, mum. Catherine Knight. I don't care if something happens to me. Catherine Knight is a cannibal killer who lives in Western Sydney's Silverwater Women's Correctional Centre, which used to be called the Mulawa Correctional Centre. Other prisoners call her the Nana. Someone who used to be in prison with Catherine Knight said, We called her the Nana. She has a kind heart and I don't see her as wicked. She sits in as an arbitrator at Mulawa. She would point out flaws before they got worse. She would pull the girls in and try to help them work things out before someone went to segregation or got more time added to their term. Question. How did Catherine Knight get into jail? What made her kill her prey and eat them? Catherine Knight was born and raised in a home that was not normal and did not work well. Barbara Rufin was her mother. She was married to Jack Rufin and lived with him in the small town of Aberdeen in the Hunter Valley of New South Wales. Barbara was cheating on her husband with Ken Knight, who was a friend and co-worker of hers at the time. Barb and Ken Knight had to leave town and live somewhere else when the affair became public. Barbara and Ken had four more children together, including twin girls in 1955. The twins had a girl named Catherine. It wasn't as great between Ken and Barbara as everyone thought. Behind the scenes, Ken was a violent drinker who beat his wife all the time. In turn, Barbara often told her girls private things about herself and how much she liked guys. Kate was very young when all of this happened and it had an effect on her later on. Because of this, she didn't have many close friends. Aside from her twin sister, Catherine's only other close relative was her uncle, Oscar Knight, a famous horseman who killed himself in 1969. Catherine even said that Oscar's ghost often came to see her. Catherine became a loner at Muswell Brook High School and is known by her peers as a mean girl who picked on little kids. You couldn't say she was the smartest tool in the shed either. She had to drop out of school when she was 15 and still didn't know how to read or write. Catherine met David Stanford Kellett when she was 18 years old. They are now married. In 1974, after a year, they got married. On the night of their wedding, Catherine tried to choke Kellett, which was a bad start to their marriage. Catherine told him later that it was because he passed out after only three sex acts. The fights didn't stop there, though. One time, Catherine, who was very pregnant, burned all of Kellett's clothes and shoes and then hit him in the back of the head with a frying pan. Kellett finally gave up because he got home late and had his fill of the situation. Catherine moved in with John Charles Thomas Price in 1995 after dating a few other guys. It would be the worst choice because Catherine's terrible crime would happen only five years later. Their relationship started to get worse over time, in part because Catherine got angry and hit Price several times and hurt him. Even more fights broke out and most of his friends stopped hanging out with him while they were still together. Price finally gave up and decided to do something. Price stopped at the Scone Magistrate's Court on his way to work on February 29, 2000, to get a restraining order against Catherine. He wanted her to stay away from him and his kids.
Catherine stabbed Price 37 times while he was sleeping and then skillfully burned his body with her favorite knife. She made a skin suit and hung it from a meat hook. Then she cut off his head and boiled it with vegetables and gravy on his stove. Price's children's names were even written on the plates because she planned to serve his body parts to them. Catherine first offered to plead guilty to killing, but her plea was turned down. She was then charged with murdering Price, and she pleaded not guilty. But while the jury was being picked, Catherine changed her plea to guilty, and the jury was sent home. Then, Supreme Court Justice Barry O'Keefe gave Knight a life sentence, which means he will never be free. The story of the woman who killed someone and was given life in prison without the chance of release was so interesting that a book was written about her. Her life in the scary Silverwater Women's Correctional Center is told in the book, Green is the New Black even. That's right, the guards never take their eyes off of her and she can't be near knives. She can't even have a cellmate in case she kills someone else. Kate had to work in a workshop every day from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. to make headphones. People say she's one of the best workers at the headphones business, so they pay her the most. But the book says that four guards stand on either side of her and watch her every move. They are with her every day. To everyone's surprise, she acts very differently in prison than she did when she was free. It was never her job to stand over anyone when she stopped girls from fighting or taking from each other. She never put out her hand to greet anyone. Everyone loved her. One prisoner said that Catherine is loved and admired by the other prisoners, but not by the guards. One cop said she's the jail's boss. She doesn't put up with BS from anyone and gives it to the guards straight. She will stand in front of you with a smug face and scream at you if you try to search her cell. It does look like a bad idea for someone to mess with her. Maves. Armin. That of Armin Maves is not like that of any other killer. He didn't kill people like the other people on this list. In 2001, his story shocked a lot of people and led to a heated discussion. Armin was born on December 1st, 1961. He was Waltred Maves' only child. His father had two older half-brothers from a relationship with another woman before he met his mother. He was eight years old when his father left him, leaving him to be raised by his mother. Following the breakup of his family, Armin said he felt very alone. He became very interested in the German fairy story Hansel and Gretel when he was a teenager. This interest would finally drive him to do something terrible that would land him in jail for life. Hansel and Gretel are brothers in the fairy tale. They are left alone in the forest and end up in the care of a witch who lives in a house made of cookies and candy. Because the witch wants to eat people, she plans to make Hansel fat before eating him. She saves her brother, though, by pushing the witch into her own oven, where she dies and runs away with the witch's treasure. Most kids would be amazed at how brave Gretel was to save her brother, but Armin was more interested in the witch. Something about her wanting to eat the little boy interested young Armin, and he would want to do the same thing as the witch as an adult. There was just one catch. Armin wasn't a killer. He didn't have the strength to get what he wanted by getting aggressive. He did the only thing he knew would work. He chose to look for someone who would be okay with being killed and their body eaten. Looking for a ready volunteer, Armin put an ad on the Cannibal Cafe a website that used to be live but is no longer, and was for people who liked cannibalism. Armin's ad said that he was looking for a strong 18, 25-year-old to kill and eat. As it turned out, Armin had his helper. In March 2001, a 43-year-old engineer from Berlin named Bern Jürgen Armando Brandes answered the ad. Interestingly, a lot of other people replied to the ad but then changed their minds and didn't go through with it. Armin and Brandis met at Armin's house on March 9th, 2001 and decided to film the whole horrible event. In the beginning, Brandis took 20 sleeping pills and a bottle of cough syrup. Then they agreed to eat Brandis' assesitas together after he was cut off. At first, Brandis told Armin to try to bite off the body part this didn't work, so Armin had to use a knife to get it off. 
Brandis tried to eat some of it raw, but it was too tough and hard. Armin then used salt, pepper, wine, and garlic to fry the body part in a pan. It didn't work out as planned because it got too hot to eat. After that, he cut the Aeorc into pieces and gave them to his dog. Armin then gave his helper a bath and went to read a Star Trek book, stopping every 15 minutes to check on her. Brandes was bleeding in the bathtub the whole time, going in and out of awareness. After a lot of thought and prayer, Armin stabbed Brandis in the throat and then hung the body from a meat hook. Over the next 10 months, Armin cut the body up and ate it. He kept the body parts in his freezer under pizza boxes and ate up to 20 kg, 44 pounds of meat. The whole thing was caught on a four-hour film that has never been shown to the public because it shows horrible things. It's said that you can find four pictures of the video online, but it's never been proven that the images are real. Armin went back to the internet to find more helpers because the event interested him. In December 2002, though, a college student told the police about new online ads for victims. The German government stepped in and searched Armin's house. Uh, the body bits and the recording of the killing were found there, and he was then arrested. Armin was found to have a schizoid mindset, but he was still found fit to stand trial. He was found guilty of manslaughter on January 30th, 2004, and given an eight-year and six-month jail term. The case got a lot of attention from the media and led to a discussion. A lot of people wondered if he should be in jail since the person he killed agreed to be killed and eaten. Still, Armin admitted to eating Brandis and said he was sorry for what he did. He was then quickly taken to jail. Although he had already started his term a year before, authorities appealed and a German court said he should be tried again. They said he should have been found guilty of murder because he killed for sexual pleasure, which was shown by the fact that he recorded the crime. The court said that the first trial didn't take into account how important the video was in showing that Armin didn't kill because he was told to. At Armin's second hearing, a doctor said that he might do something wrong again because he still had nightmares about eating young people. The courts would not let him go because he would put people in danger. In fact, on May 10, 2006, a court in Frankfurt found Armin guilty of murder and gave him a life sentence in jail. Armin turned vegetarian while he was in jail and told other people who are going through the same thing to get help so it doesn't get worse like it did for him. Some jail rules have been loosened for him because this is a one-of-a-kind case. Since 2020, Armin has been able to go on monitored trips outside of jail, to go on walks around town in a different state while wearing a mask. The fact that even guards trust him so much shows that he was never a dangerous thief.